Amen and thank you, my Lord. And good evening again to everyone and welcome to our study session. I want to commend you for your participation in our last session. We had some very good dialogue and engagement and I hope that we would be able to do the same tonight again because it is good that we can engage each other, we can participate and you can feel free to um, give your opinions and ask your questions. It makes the whole dialogue more exciting and you know it, it keeps us interested in what is happening. So I hope that we can get that sort of participation again tonight. Now, just on a side, there are a lot of people who wonder what is it that the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and those religious groups seem to have a, a more unified um, sort of grouping, meaning that they don't have the sort of divisions and denominational barriers that we have as, as Christians. We seem to have, you know, so many different factions, different belief systems, and they will say that we say we have one Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism, and yet we are so diverse, and we have so many different groups and denominations. And, and why is it that we don't see those sort of factions and divisions and those other religious groups that we claim may not? be as focused on, on the truth and the word that we are so focused on. And that's that's an interesting question. Um, I, I believe that that is the result, as I indicated from the very beginning, that we have different perspective and different interpretation on the word. Now, their, their scriptures don't allow for such diversity. A lot of the, the, the things that are proclaimed in their writings are pretty straightforward and there is not a, a lot of scope for diversity of interpretations. But the Bible, which is written by 40 different writers over a, a long period of time and which is written in apocalyptic literature, symbolic language, lends itself to a variety of interpretations. And that's one of the reasons why we have um, such a diversity, the way we see things and the way we understand things from the same Bible. And we are supposed to be guided and directed by the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, who the word indicates has come to lead us into all truth. And as I indicated from the very beginning, there's just really one truth. Jesus is the truth. His word is the truth, but I think the diversity comes because of how we interpret the scriptures. And we must remember that in the very beginning, in the early church, the Christians were focused on the apostles' doctrine. That's what we are told in Acts. They were, they were subject to the teachings of the disciples of, of Jesus who would have had the direct word from him and the people basically followed their instructions they trusted their interpretation and their perspective because they would have had direct encounter with Jesus over time as Christians joined the church as Gentiles Christians joined the church from different cultural backgrounds and from different pagan influences some of these influences came into the church and so we, we had um, even different heresies coming into the church as a result of those pagan connections. And then over time, we had people who want to assert themselves and have their own following and come in with their own doctrines and teachings. And even the Apostle Paul and John mentioned that their, in their time, there was these false teachings and these attempts by individuals to move away from the pristine word which was given. And so these are ways in which the word was adulterated. We have had, over time, a lot of false teachers, false teachings, 
And then even in our time, we would have had individuals who might be very popular and they have their different perspectives and they have their own followings and their belief systems have been adopted by a lot of people. And so we have had a whole lot of variety of interpretations. And then we have different religious groups who allow individuals basically be basically to be the main persons that have given them their teachings and their philosophies and religious beliefs. The Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, even the Adventists. And, and so we, this is one of the reasons why we would have had a whole lot of variety in the way we see scripture and the way we interpret it. So we're going to be dealing with another topic tonight that lends itself to, again, a variety of interpretation because we are dealing with figurative language and we are dealing with language which lends itself to interpretation. And once that is the case, we have people coming up with different interpretations, different perspectives. That's, that's the theme basically of our whole study, um, theological perspectives. And while we can understand sometimes people's rationale for a position that they have, yet the fact remains is that we, we can't have everybody being right if there's one truth. And it comes back to a matter of being able to, to read the word, examine it for ourselves, open ourselves to the Holy Spirit's directive and instruction, and we can come to a clear understanding of, of what that truth is as it matches with the word of God. Even as I say that, I will recognize that while I'm, I'm doing this, this session, I am basically giving my understanding and my perspective to as I believe um, can be supported by the word of God. But the reality is it comes back to my understanding of it, my perspective of it. And I believe that I would be doing that in accordance with what the word of God says, like a lot of other people would. And so even in that light, I would encourage you, like the Bereans did with the Apostle Paul, that you check the scriptures. You examine them for yourself. And don't take my word for it. I try my best as much as possible to align what I teach with the word of God. And let that be the authority that, that directs how, how I view things and my interpretation. But at the end of the day, it still comes back to how I see it, how I believe the word of God is being revealed to me. And therefore, it is still important that I, I make you aware of that. That you have to still listen to what I'm saying and you check what the word of God says and try to match it as much as possible to what I am indicating from what I am teaching you. That's very, very important. That's how we avoid being misled by, by individuals or just allowing our understanding of the word to be governed by what someone teaches us. That's how the church got carried away from the very beginning where the Catholics indicated that they had the correct understanding and the light of the word and that interpretations had to be governed by what they dictated. And then over time, as I said, we've had a number of individuals who have come along and have been able to control um, different religious groups because of, of their particular dominance and how they were viewed. So we need to make sure that we are our own students and we are studying the word and we examine it as careful as we possibly can in in the light of what that word is saying to us and and god's directive i remember we said that's one of the important principles that we need to apply when we're studying the word of god that we need to pray we need to seek god's wisdom and god's direction because the interpretation comes from him and we've seen in the Bible where there was a difficulty in understanding God himself revealed the word or sent an angel to give instruction and to clarify what the interpretation of the word uh, was supposed to be. And he's still doing that. He's still giving us clarification through the power of his spirit as to how scriptures can be viewed. He's given us teachers and there are people who have 
devote themselves to studying the word and understand the scriptures. And, and yes, we pay attention to those teachers, but we've got to, to study the word for ourselves and make sure what is being taught matches back with the word. So we're on to the kingdom tonight. And that's a very, very broad topic. So obviously it's going to take us more than one session because we have to look at some important prophecies from the book of Isaiah and from Jeremiah, two prophets that have given us a lot of information about the kingdom. And remember, a lot of the language that has been used is symbolic or figurative language. And it has been open to interpretation. And people have come up with different interpretations as to what those particular references are, are indicating. And I hope that we will get a chance to, to look at a number of these because we really can't look at all of them, but we'll look at some of the important scriptures that have lent themselves to different interpretations. And we'll try to understand why people have a, a certain perspective. And we will try to seek to get an understanding from the word itself by comparing it with other passages of scripture because we have to do that and looking at the New Testament and comparing it with the Old Testament because again, that's one of the principles that we have to follow. And we look for how the New Testament writers interpret some of the Old Testament passages in relation to the kingdom. And we also examine very carefully some of the very words that were given by Jesus himself in relation to the kingdom. Because he will be the king of the kingdom and he is, is the word himself. And we have then to get a clear understanding from the teaching of, of Jesus himself. So it's very important that we understand that. So we're going to have to look at the book of Daniel. We had in the beginning of our study recognized when we were looking at Revelation that there is harmony between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And when it comes to the subject of the kingdom, the book of, of Daniel is, I think, the, the only book that gave us a, a specific timeline and indication as to when the kingdom would come and be established. And of course, the premillennials have a different interpretation of, of the timeline for the kingdom and when it's going to be established. And we will examine that and try to understand their particular position and understanding of the kingdom and match that with the scriptures that we are going to be researching to see if that is the correct perspective and interpretation of the kingdom. And then we would have to do um, a, a deeper study as well of Revelation chapter 20. We hinted at that, but we would have to do a more in-depth study of, of Revelation. So tonight we would hope to look closer at the book of Daniel, chapter 2 and chapter 9. Those were passages that we have made reference to previously. Chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9. We're going to look in a little more detail at chapter 9 because of the fact that that, that gives an indication of the specific time period when the kingdom of God will be established on the earth. And the reason why that is so significant is because it gives the Bible a very authoritative position in terms of its credibility and its, and its reliability. That here you will have a, a prophet giving prophecy 500 years before the time. And we have Isaiah as well giving prophecy to us 700 years before the time it was fulfilled. Now, if, if, if that can happen, it is a clear indication that this is revelation that will have to come from God who sees the future, who can put it in the mouth of these prophets to indicate that future and it accurately comes to pass as they have prophesied. Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, and Jeremiah, yes, would give more of the, of the character and the nature of the kingdom. Daniel also gave some indication of some of the things that will happen um, as a result of the establishment of that kingdom that we will look at. But what is important is the, the timeline. And we will give a little examination of that timeline, again, 
that is a pretty deep study which we might not be able to go into in all details, but we will still try as much as possible to give um, information which is very relevant and very pertinent to the, to the timeline that we see how, how significant um, this prophecy is. It, is. it is so important that some people question like, the, the like time. Question the time as to when um, Daniel's prophecy was made because it, it so accurately falls in line with the coming of the Messiah that people say it had to be written at a later date and perhaps um, some indicate that it might be have, have even been written after the Messiah came because they, they could not envisage that a, a, a person writing or making a prophecy could be so accurate. But this is obviously an indication that it's not just something written by man. It's a revelation given by God himself who sees into the future and who has control over what happens in the future. And he can indicate how that future is going to turn out through the lips of persons that have been ordained to speak um, on his behalf. So, so that gives the, the Christian perspective a very strong position in terms of the authenticity and the reliability of the Bible. And we will recognize that, that, that Daniel himself was, was reading prophecies given by Jeremiah and Isaiah, and he was coming to a position of interceding on behalf of his own people based on those prophecies that, that he would have read. And those are some of the same prophecies that we have in our Bible today that we are reading. So if Daniel read them from way back then, and he accepted that the information was, was very relevant and pertinent to his time, then again, it shows how authentic it is that we are reading those same prophecies um, way down in time that still connects to something that, that Daniel read and believed at the time he was making his intercession on behalf of the Jews and then given the revelation from God to prophesy further into the future. Now, there are a number of questions that we have to try to get answered as we seek to examine this topic. I try to, to send out some of them to you. I don't know how many of them will be made available and a number of scripture passages which we have to examine. But if they have not reached you, don't let that be a problem because I will identify um, passages and some of the questions that we need to consider. And, and I will hope to try to engage you from the very beginning to get you know your thoughts, your, your opinions on, on, on things or information that you might have researched on your own or your understanding and interpretation of, of the word that you might have read. I think that is important. Again, trying to avoid having to, to give you information, but rather to start from, from where you are and see what your understanding is and try to work with your understanding and helping to interpret and to clarify um, things that you might need some further clarification on. So one of the questions we have to answer is the kingdom of God present? Is it future? Or is it both? Meaning, is it can it be viewed as present and yet future? Is the kingdom of God physical? Meaning that it is a sort of like political entity established in a particular place at a particular time um, and, and govern in the way um, political kingdoms or earthly kingdoms will be governed? Or is it spiritual? That is, is it Christ reigning in the lives of, of believers and, and governing through spiritual principles? Or is it both? So I'm going to pause on those two questions first and see if there are any reflections that you want to make on those. Is the kingdom of God present or future or both? Is the kingdom of God physical or spiritual? And if there are any passages that you can quote that have given you some understanding, I want, I want you to do that. So, you know, we get to engage each other with your own references from your own understanding and your own interpretation rather than just going by what I say to you. Okay, so I'm going to 
pause on those first two and and you can respond. And then I give you three others in case you don't perhaps in your dialogue bring those up or even answer them in your response. You can look at those. So is the kingdom of God present, future, or both? How do you see it? Is the kingdom of God physical or spiritual? Yes, good night, Pastor. Good night to you. Yes, please. The kingdom of God is a present reality. Mm -hmm. First of all, because um, you can't have a kingdom for a king. And right. Christ is our king. And we are a part of his kingdom. So, king is a present reality. And okay. I can't quote the scripture now as far as the, the book and the chapter and stuff, but Christ says that people will say, here's the kingdom or there's the kingdom. He says that the kingdom of God doesn't come by observation. Mm -hmm. And he says that the kingdom of God is, is within us. So we have okay. God ruling from the inside of us, from the hearts of men. So to put it this way, then the, the kingdom of God is within us because we make it the kingdom. God is ruling from our hearts because that way it is. The kingdom of God is God's rule or God's reign. So he's reigning presently. Um, there's a there's a song we sing in the church of God, Himba. Um, what others dream of an age to come is to come is reigning in our hearts today. In our hearts today. So, right. So we have we have the kingdom of God as a present thing right now. So again, if we if we see it that way, I think we will live a better life for sure because God is reigning in our hearts. But actually, there, there will be a time then when 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 no evil would be a part of this kingdom that's the end of the age when Christ comes back and then that that that, that does be really the fulfillment of the kingdom will be then where he'd be reigning and nobody else would be offended would be would be on the outside of that kingdom okay thank you very much brother weeks and the verse that you have made reference to I think that's Luke 17 20 21 and when the, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come he answered them by saying, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now that, that answers one of the questions again that I was going to ask for. What is the kingdom of God within us? So that, that particular passage there would, would, would answer that, that question. And the reason why it is essential that we understand that is because there are people or i should say theologians mainly in the premillennial group who believe that the kingdom of god has to come as a physical reality in a specific place at a specific time and for a specific duration and this is where we will have to examine um revelation chapter 20 because that's the basis for their interpretation and their understanding and their perspective of the kingdom of god in 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 that particular um, instance they see it as a time to come when God will set up a kingdom physically and he will rule on the throne of David physically and that will be for a thousand years. This is where we get the millennium and that's the, the, their perspective of the kingdom. So it is still yet future because that has not yet been realized because according to their assessment, Christ has not physically reigned on the throne of David and therefore, that is still to come. And they see that as being fulfilled in that passage in um, Revelation chapter 20. Okay, so so thank you very much for for your expression there. Any other persons want Good to weigh in? Good night, Reverend yes. Randy. Yes. Speaking. yes, Brother Randy. In Luke chapter one, 11, sorry, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, one of the disciples mm -hmm. said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught the disciples. And he said unto them, When he prays here, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy, thy, thy kingdom come. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that's yes. what he's teaching them to pray, that the kingdom will come. Right. So, how do we 
connect that now with the question you're asking. If we are, if Jesus is saying to me, pray that thy kingdom will come and it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right. So that is one of the objections level against those group of theologians. And we fall into the group of theologians that believe that the kingdom of God is a present reality. A lot of the amillennialists are, are of that persuasion. And, and we believe that, as Brother Weeks has indicated, we believe it is a present reality. Now, we will check scriptures that will explain to us what we view as a present reality and uh, how we view the perspective of the kingdom. Now, the, the, ob the objectors to that particular position use that same passage that you just read to say that the kingdom has not yet come because if it had come, where would Jesus pray as his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come? Now, you, you read the follow-up part of that which is very significant in explaining what he meant. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God represents people who are subject to the will and the authority of God on earth as it is in heaven. The angels are subject to the authority of God and God's kingdom on earth represent people subject to the authority of Christ following his commands and following his directives and following his authority and allowing him to reign in their lives spiritually. So Jesus is telling his disciples that you, we, they are to pray for that that realization that, that his kingdom will come basically in the hearts and lives of people where they will be subject to the will of God as it is obeyed in heaven. That's how we interpret that particular passage and not that Jesus is saying that they are to pray for a kingdom to come in the future that has not yet arrived. Because as we will see, the coming of the kingdom was established at the advent of Christ, at the coming of Christ. And we will see that from what Daniel's prophecy was. So that's why our interpretation of that is that Jesus was actually telling his disciples the prayer for the realization that is in a spiritual sense what it is, what it ought to be on earth as it is in heaven. So in other words, thy kingdom come is not ended there. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God coming in the hearts and lives of people. That his will, God's will, will be obeyed in their lives and God's authority will govern and rule in their hearts. That's our interpretation. Now, I want you to tell me what you think about that. If it sounds reasonable. If it I sounds not, And if it sounds... Strange, yes. So, Brother Randy, I don't know if... You would agree with that, but I, as I tell you, that's the that's the amillennial perspective on that particular verse, which the premillennialists have challenged us on in saying that the, that the kingdom is not yet. So, how do you I'm see that up, interpretation? I'm putting, up, I'm putting up the view for others, but I believe in what Reverend Week says. I yes. believe that because I believe what Reverend Week say, and the scriptures teach that. But then I'm putting the argument for people who would use that verse to right. say that Jesus told people to press so I'm, I'm i'm actually doing a rebut okay to see to see how other people will be thinking too yes and you are right because as i said that's one of the arguments that they put forward and i, I will list a few other arguments too that they put forward to, to to justify their particular position but that verse that 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 wendell um made reference to that i quoted from the scripture and you can write that down as one of the, the passages that I want you to research because that is a very, very significant um, verse because the Pharisees were demanding of Jesus when the kingdom of God should come, which means that they had not accepted the fact that the kingdom of God was in their presence, in their midst. And we will look at some other scriptures which, which suggested that um, directly. And Jesus says it does not come with observation. Neither shall they say low here or low there, which means that you, can, you cannot identify the kingdom of God in reference to a specific place. Like the premillennialists the pre would indicate that the kingdom of God is going to be established in Jerusalem in the future. And Christ will literally reign in Jerusalem sometime in the future because we do not know when that time will be. Because according to their timeline, we should basically have been in the millennium already because we should have had the rapture 
we should have had the tribulation and we should be basically according to their time schedule the 80 millennium it has not happened yet so the question is is their interpretation right or is it still further down the future and 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 what timeline will we be looking at as a matter of fact there's there's no specific indication as to when the millennium would start if it if is if it is going to be a reality so we could still um be in a position where we would have been waiting to see whether or not that will be realized and that's where we really are and and, and to take jesus statements seriously we can't tell by observation we cannot put out um point out a, a specific specific location or place so that goes contrary to what they are saying and he says for behold the kingdom of god is within you now again they they they, they use the argument that Jesus really could not mean that the kingdom of God is within the hearts of those Pharisees. Now, Jesus was using a generic statement there. He was not specifically telling the Pharisees that the kingdom of God is in their hearts because their counter argument is he, 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 he couldn't be really saying that the kingdom of God is in the hearts of people who we call hypocrites and what was sepulchers and, and, and who we basically told that they need to take the beam out of their eyes before they see the more in somebody's eye. So the Pharisees, as far as Jesus was concerned, were, were not um, subject to the authority and the rule of God. So how could he have been saying that the kingdom of God is within them? But Jesus was using a generic statement. He was basically saying the kingdom of God is in the hearts and in the lives of people who are subject to the authority and to the will of the Father. That's what I believe he means when he says the kingdom of God is within you. And he was not directly speaking to the Pharisees and telling them that they have the kingdom of God in them. Because, again, Jesus had to reprimand the Pharisees for their religious um, stance and, 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 and relationship with God uh, um, on, on many occasions. So I believe he was using a, a, a generalized statement to say to us that the kingdom of God is going to come in the hearts of men and women who are subject to the authority of God. We sing a hymn, but we used to sing that, that hymn. Um, we don't sing it very often now. It was a beautiful hymn, The Kingdom of Peace. And the, the chorus to that hymn says, um, There's a kingdom of peace. It is reigning within. It shall ever increase in my soul. We possess it right here. When he saves from all sin, and to the last where the ages shall roll. Now that's theology there, right there in that hymn. That's theology that is saying that the kingdom of God is in our hearts. He's reigning in our hearts today. And that is going to be an everlasting kingdom that Christ has established and will continue and will reach its consummation when he returns. But we possess it right here when he saves from all sin. So it's Christ reigning in the hearts of men. That was written by Barney E. Warren. He was one of the pioneers um, of, of the Church of God and one of, of, of the great hymn writers. And, and that was part of the theology that he believed, which he put into sound. And that's the theology that we still believe today and we still preach. Yes, and we Rev. believe yes. that we be able Rev. to see from the word. Yes. Rev, just before Randy makes um, another comment or question, um, Ryan, Brother Ryan, he, yes. he, he yes. has either a question or a comment as well. So, Brother Ren and then um, uh, Brother Randy. Yes, Brother Ren. Go ahead. Hi, good night. Yes, please. Good night. Um, I was looking at Romans 14, verse 17, which says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, yes. peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. For me, so if I had to define the kingdom of God, um, I'd basically say uh, two or four things. The so I would define it as one as the kingdom of God, wherever God reigns or rules. And yes. two, wherever his rule or reign is being experienced. Mm -hmm. So where he reigns or where he rules, I, I could probably put out to a physical place. For instance, in heaven, you know, he's yes. the king out there, right? Right. So I put that as place. In terms of where his rule or reign now is being experienced, I see that now as more spiritual or being within you. So I would tend to agree with that song, right? Uh, you know, Sam Barney, okay. Warren. Yes. Right. And, and then the question was whether it's spiritual or, or, or physical. 
Right, that that would I play very much the spiritual where Paul said it's not meat and drink, but joy and righteousness and but peace and joy in the in the Holy Spirit. So so we're we're dealing with spiritual experiences that, that come um in, in in our relationship with Christ. And even the kingdom of peace, the part of the of the stanzas of that song indicate that there is joy, there's peace, there's gladness. It's the kingdom of God righteousness. That's that's the, the song where also express that that it's it's internal experiences that come as Christ reigns and rules in our heart. So we are subject to his authority. So it's it's a heavy spiritual entity, but of course it will have a physical consummation. Because when Christ comes back to the earth and he gathers all the saints together, and we discuss all that already after the resurrection and the judgment, we will reign with Christ physically. In a place that he has gone to prepare for us. And, and, and right now, we are reigning with him on earth, as we will come to see as we examine um, Revelation 20 in greater detail. And you will, you will be surprised to see um, some of the things that can come out from a, a close, in depth study of Revelation 20, and, and also how it dispels um, some of the other interpretations that people have. In relation to a, a literal thousand year reign on earth. Because as I indicated, when we match that particular concept with other things that have been indicated in the word of God, it is going to cause problems. And I will not go into them now. I will leave that for when we get to interpret Revelation chapter 20 and that millennial kingdom. Because if Christ comes back and reign on the earth for a thousand years, we have serious issues with other teachings of the Bible which would definitely contradict a lot of the things that will happen if that millennial kingdom is, is truly a reality of what the word of God is indicating. All right, any other comments before we look at? Yes, Reverend Jackman. Yes. Uh, no, Back to you, Randy. St. John 18, 36. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. Yes. My were of this word, then will my servants fight? You know, and, and this has to do with when Paglet questioned him. So, how do we view this verse? When he said, my, this verse is saying to us in connection with what he's saying earlier that all right, a palace or anything. So, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. Then, my kingdom that, that, of this, go ahead, go ahead. You, you, yes, that, no. Now that's that's another good passage, Randy. You you are finding the, the very key passages that the objectors to our particular position that the kingdom of God is a present reality. That's another one of the passages that they cite. That when Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world, he was saying to the people that he was speaking to, his kingdom then is not yet. It is not of that world, it is of a world to come. That's how they interpret that. So he was actually saying. No, my kingdom is set up yet because my kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this age. It's not of this time period. It is, it is to come. Now, he didn't go on to say that. That is what they are adding to the word. He did not go on to say, my kingdom is not of this world. It is of the future. That's their interpretation. They are saying that Jesus was saying, my kingdom basically is future. He did not say that. He said, if my kingdom would, were of this world, then would, then would my servants fight. They would fight to defend me. They would, uphold, they would fight to uphold my reign. What he's saying is, it is not of the nature of the kingdoms of this earth, where people fight, where people establish power and authority, and have, have um, soldiers fighting on their behalf, and they're conquering lands and territories. That's what he meant. And we have to look also at how Jesus used the world. He says, you are in the world, but not of the world. But you, but Reverend Jackman, yes. you remember when, when, Cruz, when Christ was arrested, yes. Yes, this could be connected with what we are thinking. Peter took his sword. That's right. And ears off. Yes. And he was told him, put up your sword because if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. So again, you think that because you know when people fought in kingdoms, they fought and take over kingdoms. So Peter, That's was, right. Peter well, was willing to defend Christ because Peter in his mind said, well, look, if there's a king, I got to defend the king. Have you seen, have you seen what I'm saying? 
Yes, yeah, yes. That's a very good point, Randy. Turn and tell Peter, Peter, look, you know what I'm going to tell you? Put up your sword, because if you live by that sword, you're going to die by the sword. And then Peter and the others realized later that his kingdom was not of such a physical nature, but spiritual. Very good. I, I remember that Jesus took up the ear, because remember Peter um, severed the person's ear with the sword. And, and, and replaced it. So it, it, he is he's definitely showing them by example, listen, no, this is not what my kingdom is about. And that is precisely what he meant. Now, this is what I indicated from the very beginning. We get different perspectives because of different interpretative spins that people put on the word. That's what creates the problems. It's not that it's not the truth. And that's the reason why we get all the different denominations because we have a lot of people putting interpretation on the word that was never that were never really intended and if we study the scriptures carefully and take some time as i indicate to reflect on, on the, the context of it very very important because words and phrases have meaning according to the context and and, and jesus was indicating as you rightfully pointed out that that his kingdom is not a, a, a belligerent warfaring type of kingdom like the ones that were established and which Daniel identified, which we will come to when we start to look at, at Daniel. His kingdom was completely different from those kingdoms. And it is of a spiritual nature. And that's why Jesus never encouraged people to fight and to war, to establish him and put him on the throne. That was a gross misunderstanding that the Jews had. They thought that the kingdom was to be of that nature. They were subject to the authority of the Roman Empire, which Daniel prophesied would have been the one in place when Christ came, which we will see. Very, very specific. Again, showing the authoritative um, position of the word of God long before Daniel saw that the Roman Empire would have been the one in power when Christ came in to the world. Augustus Caesar was reigning. Herod was one of the governors in Judea who sought to kill Jesus as a baby. All of that is happening under the Roman um, Empire. And, and, and so, the, the correct interpretation, when Jesus says, if my kingdom were of this world, that's the explanation that he was giving to, to, to be sure that we understood. He's not saying my kingdom is not for this time or for this age. He's saying it's not of this nature of, of, of the world and the way the world is governed and the way kingdoms are established. People conquer territories they, 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 um, they, they create a, a lot of disruption in, in, in places by, by war through the sword and the spear, the spear and the sword, sorry. And, and his kingdom is not of that nature at all. It's not of this world. That is what he meant. And that's a second um, clarification, by the Randy, which you would have introduced, which I would have um, been bringing to us to examine, and there's a, a, a third one which we need to look at, but I want to wait and see if somebody will bring that up. Reverend Gentleman, we, yes. um, let's put a few comments uh, from the chat uh, Yes, that you may need to comment on. So Sandra Pollard Bostic um, references Mark, verse, Mark, Mark 9 verse 1 um, mm -hmm. to support the present spiritual kingdom. Okay. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, Till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Right. Right. And, and uh, that, that, Sandra, is a very, very good verse. Uh, it's, it's another verse that people misinterpret. And if they understand that carefully and study what it's saying, it, it means that Christ is speaking of something that people living at that time will realize. There are some of you standing here that will not taste of death till you see the the kingdom coming in its fullness. What he was referring to is the kingdom of God coming in its fullness on the day of Pentecost. That that's that's the, the inauguration of the of the of the of the power of the kingdom of God coming in its fullness where the Holy Ghost descended on the apostles on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus was making reference to that. He didn't say specifically that that's what he was um, speaking of, but interpretations from a lot of um Bible commentators believe that he was referring to that time, the kingdom of God coming in its fullness on the day of Pentecost, 
And he's saying to those people that some of those that were present in his midst were going to be there when that happened. And on that day, thousands of Jews from all over the, the Roman Empire were gathered and witnessed the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples and the empowerment that was given to them. And that's a very good verse to indicate that Jesus was speaking of a present reality of his kingdom. And that was the full inauguration of it. Thank you, Sandra, for that, that verse. Um, in addition, we also have one yes. other comment from Robert. Um, he says, I am is a present continuous name. Yes. Since God transcends time, the kingdom was always here. When one right. believes the kingdom is activated in their life. That's right. That's true. And that's it from the chat. I think I see okay. Janelle's um, mic on. I'm not sure if they wish to speak. All right. Well, since nobody is speaking, I'll throw another objection. We would have had um, two, the Lord's Prayer. And my kingdom is not of this world. And there's another objection. First Corinthians... 15, we read part of that. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So the argument is that we cannot now be living in the kingdom because we are flesh and blood. And Jesus, well, Paul, Paul said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So this can only happen after the resurrection when we are spiritual beings. Now, who wants to take that on? Is that what Paul meant? That's the third objection that is given. Can anybody respond to that? Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Um, there's this passage that, of scripture that came to mind. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where it's taken from, but it says that God calls his true worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. So if we are worshiping right now in spirit and in truth, that means that just as we are, we can be living in in that, that kingdom experience based on that scripture. Yes, because if we worship him, we have to be worshiping, worshiping somebody. And our Christians are worshipping Jesus and if you're worshipping him in spirit and in truth and we are worshipping a king and, and a king as Brother Weeks indicated from the beginning has a kingdom and he has subjects and we are his subjects and he is our king and we are worshipping him so we are part of his kingdom spiritually so would the objectors have you then stump you nobody seem to be able to handle that one I heard, I heard that coming from the Worldwide Church of God. And that was a, a major objection because they, they believe in the Millennial Kingdom. That's our, our strong, um, church. Um, and their argument is that we cannot now be part of the Kingdom of God. I mean, they, they've got to be omitting a whole lot of other verses which we will, we will also look at. Um, because we are flesh and blood. And, and, and Paul indicate that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So therefore, we cannot be part of that kingdom because we are flesh and blood. What do you say to those persons who have that objection to the present reality of the kingdom? Pastor, the question is, um, the, is it, isn't it the only way that you can get to heaven is through death? The only way that uh, we can uh, get... Uh, um, well, uh, unless you are translated like Enoch. Yes, please. <laughs> or Elijah. Yes, please. Yes, please. But, yes, right. Please. But, but and, and here, and, and we ain't got many more coming after that. So it, it is it is true death. Right. This is to be absent from the body, as Paul says, and to be present with the Lord. Correct. Right. So so you go on to say from that, what else? Right. So so if the, the only way, all right. Couple things. First of mm -hmm. all, we live in Barbados. 
So, so before you go for before you go for Mendel, do you, you so do you disagree with this statement? Of course I do. Okay, all right. Of course I do because 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 the only way that you can get to heaven is true is dying. Paul right. says you can't enter the kingdom of heaven with flesh and blood. I understand that because right. he says that your body is changed; it is sown one way, yes, and then it is resurrected another way. Yes, so it talks about different bodies and stuff that you have. One is one is a he called, he used different 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 terms for the for the real how it is sown and then the real how it is resurrected. So mm. I understand from that text that in order for Wendell to get to heaven, I have to die, or as you say, be like Enoch or be like Elijah. So this right. this flesh that I have on blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, but it enters another way. It is sown flesh and blood, but it is raised another way. Paul says corruptible and then incorruptible right right so i say it that way now that, that that's a different thing but no what i'm saying now is that barbados is a nation by itself mm -hmm. we say i pledge allegiance to my country by barbados and all, but all kind of stuff but what i'm saying now is that the church is also a nation within this nation yes so so yeah. so, so 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 even though i respect the law and pay taxes and whatever you have to do. The Bible also says that we shall also give to God, which is God's. So Christ is reigning in his church, a nation within a nation. And mm -hmm. people have to understand that once you are Christian, you are already in a nation and you're already a part of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and, and it's not, it's, it's almost like somebody say you don't have eternal life. No. You get eternal living and die. That is not true. When you, when you, because you have eternal life, when you die, you will go further on with Christ. You don't get it when you die. So just as you have eternal life as a present reality, you also have the kingdom of God as a present reality right now. Mm -hmm. So, That's so, right. so, so th this thing about um, flesh and blood, I think, I think they have the wrong view. The wrong view is that they see everything as out yonder at the end of the age. Mm -hmm. But Paul says that if we suffer with him, that, that, that we shall reign with him. So we are actually yeah. reigning presently too with Christ. Yeah, yeah, we are. And, and, you, and you see, again, what you have to be clear on, that's why we need to, to clarify the interpretation of, of, of kingdom. There is a spiritual kingdom, but there is the kingdom to come with the consummation of all things. When Christ returns to the world and bring an end to all of man's kingdoms and establish the consummate kingdom, which is the eternal kingdom, which all the saints will be part of, very clear, well done, well good and faithful servant, enter into what was prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you on myself. Now, we have to go again to the context. What was Paul talking about in Basically, the whole of First Corinthians 15, he was talking about the resurrection, the age to come, the consummate kingdom, where there will be a resurrection in the, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The dead shall rise, the corruptible shall put on incorruption, and the mortal shall put on immortality. We shall all be changed. So, in that sense, the persons who inherited inheriting that consummate eternal kingdom are not the same flesh and blood people living now. But while we are here, flesh and blood, yes, we are part of God's spiritual kingdom. So they are mixing up the two. So they are looking at eternal consummate kingdom and saying, yes, spiritual beings, people who are now immortal, People who are now incorruptible will be in that kingdom because we have been changed. But that's the consummate kingdom. So the kingdom of God is a present reality, but it's also a future reality. That, that's the question I asked in the very first instance. It's a special spiritual reality where people are reigning with Christ. He is the king of the spiritual kingdom that is existent. He is reigning in our hearts. We are under his control. We have laws. So you have basically a, a kingdom has the king, it has subjects, and it has laws. Christ has all of those. He is the king of the kingdom that, that he is spiritually reigning over. We are the 
subjects, the children who are born again in Jesus Christ, and there are laws governing how we conduct ourselves. And these are laws given to us in the word as we submit to the authority of Christ. So we are really a kingdom, and we are flesh and blood people now in the spiritual kingdom, but in the consummate eternal kingdom, the mortal shall put on immortality. We are not going to bleed anymore. We are not going to die anymore. We are not flesh and blood in that sense because we have put on, a, 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 um, we, we are cloaked in a different um, existence. And that's where they are mixing it up. So that's our interpretation of that. And that's how we would dispel that particular position that we can't say that we are part of a kingdom because we are flesh and blood and, and that it would only happen after resurrection. That's a different um, perspective that Paul was speaking about. That's the eternal consummate kingdom which comes at the end of all things. I hope that that, that will clarify any doubt in, in people's mind as to whether or not they would have had us in a stranglehold on, on, on that particular verse. I don't think uh, they, they do. Yes, Jeff? Uh, yeah, Rev. Uh, we have mm -hmm. um, Richard Percival. He has yes. a comment or question. Yeah, good night, gentlemen. Good night, everyone. Good night to you. Um, yes, you, you let us along the same line that I began um, introduced. Mm -hmm. I've been going back, way back with Adam and say, mm -hmm. how did Adam communicate with God? And I think I didn't also mention when Jesus leave here on the Mount of Transfiguration, how did he leave? So, yes. but you, you explain basically on the on the on the concept. Okay. So 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 where are you on the kingdom? How do you see it? Well, I I I never really look at it in that perspective where the kingdom, but I, I, I believe that we we worship God and spirit and the truth because as I said mm -hmm. when um I know communicate with God he was both in um a uh, physical and a spiritual form because because uh, Adam was perfect in in, in context because he did not say he only after, after Adam saying that he was that's the guy, but before Adam, Adam is saying Adam was perfect, perfect. So and he, he was a God and spirit, and spirit and a body form. He, he, yeah. he had this God. Okay. Now how do you see that part? And then when Jesus, when Jesus leave on the on I mean, to, 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 to let the disciples on the final time, he left in that glorified body. When I, when I believe that. When we die and rise, and we go with God, we can be going in a similar body. Yeah. Because, because you have to establish the fact that after the resurrection, remember that? Because Jesus stayed on the earth a little while before he left, before he departed. And he, he was in the resurrected body while he was still yet on the earth. Remember that? that that's why Thomas could put the, the, his hand aside and still feed the hole because Jesus is, now, is not flesh and blood, basically. Um... He, he came through a uh, solid wall while they were in the room, you know, hiding basically and 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 um, um, and in the distress over the loss of, of, of their savior who they thought would have been the Messiah. And 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 also recognize that, that Jesus came out of the tomb without having to roll away the stone. So you see, we're talking right about a glorified body already. That that's what Paul it's, it's seeking to get us to understand when we are resurrected and Jesus first fruit of those who came back from the grave on his own, which means he really is 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 the is the leading way to what resurrection authority and power is going to look like. First fruit. So he, he gave us then a glimpse of, of what a resurrected body is like. Mortal putting on immortality. He was completely different. Right. So we, we, we accept that fact that Jesus was in, in, a, in a glorified um, body even before he departed from, from from the earth. Meaning he had a resurrected body which we know basically is not going to die again. Alright, so we can move on then. 
and we would pick up in the book of Daniel. We are, we are now looking at prophecies. Uh, related. Yes. Somebody has a question? I believe uh, Randy may have had a query. Right? A query. Yes, Randy, go ahead. I just wanted to ask you now, we, we are thought that man is spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. In connecting with what you were saying just now and responding to Wendell. When right. I come to Christ, or I hear the word of God, I come to Christ, I made a commitment to him. I'm asking which part of man is now changed? Is it the physical body? It is his heart. Which part of man is now changed? And I'm asking this against the background of how you respond to Wendell. Well, we have to look at what the scripture tells us. Any man in Christ is a new creature or a new creation. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. The question is what has passed, what has become new? Your physical body is still basically the same. You are, you are not a, a spiritual um, entity in, in the sense of how um, Jesus' body was as resurrected or what Paul was describing. You are still flesh and blood. You are still going to die even though you accept Christ. You are still going to have pain. So, so that has not changed. But that is going to have complete redemption. So, so your body then has not been totally redeemed. So therefore you are still going to um, in the flesh experience things of a, of a body that has not completely uh, fully been, been, been consummated in, 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 in the full way that it's supposed to be um, in, in the complete fulfillment of God's purpose. But Paul went on to say is that we must be renewed in our minds. So I believe that that's where the renewal take place in our mind, our heart, our spirit. That's the unseen entity of man. You, you describe it as soul and you describe it as spirit because our whole thought pattern and our, and our whole spiritual nature, because we're now born of the seed of, of, of God, there's a spiritual um, part of us which has received the, the, the power of God which changes we see things differently, we understand things differently, and we are renewed in our mind. Now, for us to continue in that form, we must be subject to the authority of, of the Spirit of God, because the word indicates to us in Romans, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh or of the mind. For to be carnally minded is enmity against God, for God cannot operate in the carnal mind. So, which means then that it is still flesh in us. That's the point I'm making. We are still flesh and blood. We are still subject to carnal forces. But as long as we allow the spirit of God to control us, and we are renewed in our minds, and we are abiding in divine, and we are we are sapping the spiritual power and vitality from Christ, we will be able to walk in the spirit and walk a renewed life that is in righteousness. Meaning that sin does not reign in our mortal body. Again, have we been perfected in the sense that we do not sin? John says no. If we say you have no sin, the truth is not in you and you lie. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. Paul said, who shall deliver me from this bondage? When we want to do good, evil presents itself. So when we are saved, the, 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 the physical nature in us is still there, but it's subject to the power and the authority, once we allow God to reign. Jesus says, if you enter, you first must bind the strong man that is there. The devil has been the strong man in our lives, and Christ will bind him and liberate us from him if we allow Christ to come into our lives in his fullness, meaning he operates in the authority. He reigns on the throne. He is now Lord of our lives. When that happens, our mind is renewed, our spirit is renewed, and we act and we behave different. As long as we remain on that, that authority, if we fall away from it, the flesh will resume its authority, get back on the throne. And that's why Jesus says, if you allow the devil to come back in, he's going to bring more demons because he knows that he has to repossess the, the, the body with more power and authority. And that's why your beginning, your end is worse than the beginning. And that's why when people backslide, it's difficult for them to return to Christ. So, so, in, in essence, that's how we see the, the transformation or the change that takes place in a life that receives Christ. The change is in the spirit. 
in the soul or, or the mind, the will, those are the things that will have to come under the control and the power and the authority. The flesh is still there, still wants to exercise its authority, and we have to constantly remain subject to the, the, the authority of Christ. One person puts it, if there are two dogs that are operating in the body, if you feed one and starve the other, the one that you feed will live, and the one that you starve will die. If you feed the spirit, he will live. And you know we we liken it to the to the, the analogy, but 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 it's not a good analogy. But that's what a person was saying in trying to explain it. And if we starve the the, the animal that is seeking to have dominance, that will die. And that's basically how how we live a Christian life. We are living it in the flesh, but only the control of the spirit. Once we give the spirit the authority that he has, that strong man that was once there will remain bound. And that's how we're going to explain the binding of Satan even when we come to Revelation 20. Not a literal binding. Jesus was not literally tearing up the devil now with a chain and dropping him in a pit. He was taking authority over his power. And once you give Christ that authority because he said, I stand at the door and knock. You have to release in submission your will to the control of God. If you don't do that, the strong man is going to get possession of you again and rule over your life. So, Randy, that's how my perspective of it is that our spirit, our soul, that's the, the invisible part of us. The spiritual part is what is renewed, is what has changed. And once we remain on the authority of, of God, Sin will not reign in our mortal body. We will not become perfect overnight. You don't become perfect when you become a Christian and you give your life over to Christ because you now have to let the Spirit of, of God get the authority and that comes as you submit your will. And submission is a daily exercise. And whenever we fail to submit our will to God's will, then we will find that sin will present itself and have dominion over us. But Paul asks, who shall deliver me from that? I thank God. For there is no, no condition in them who walk in Christ Jesus, who are in Christ Jesus, who are not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Paul is saying that is the victory that overcomes. That's how we get out of, of the carnal dominance, that sin will no longer reign in the mortal body. Reigning meaning having preeminence. Not that we are sinless, but we sin less. I hope you get the concept. We are not sinless, but we sin less. Unless, unless, unless moving on to the perfect man as we allow Christ to have reign and sovereignty on the throne of our hearts. Hope that makes it clear for you and, and, and for others. All right, Daniel. We have just 15 minutes remaining, and as I said, this is a, a particularly a, a, a deep study. Now, we saw in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, and chapter 8, God give visions of the kingdoms, and these are gentle kingdoms that will reign all the way through to Jesus. Now, in the first one, um, the first vision that was given, well, it was in an image which Nebuchadnezzar saw. He had a dream. And again, this shows the power and the authority of the word of God. And the king could not remember the dream. And in the context, and he asked his soothsayers and his magicians and all those if they could tell him the dream he had, what reward he would give to them. They can't because they can't, they can't see that, but God can. And when it was presented to Daniel, and Daniel sought God's wisdom and understanding. He was shown what the vision, what the image represented. And Daniel could tell the king what his dream was. Now, how could he do that as a man? God inspired. And, 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 and notice God is here giving um, the future of history through a pagan king. Remember that. He's shown that through a pagan king. So, so, so God can choose to reveal what he wants to reveal to any person he chooses to reveal it to. And, and so when the Buchanan was a, was, a, was a pagan king, God gave him um, 
a vision which would again be interpreted to show us the kingdoms that will come. Babylon, the Medo Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. Daniel said in chapter 2, verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. See that? Hear that? Daniel said it in prophecy, meaning that during the, 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 the dispensation then of all of these Gentile kings from Babylon down to Rome, through the Greeks and, and, and the, and the Medo-Persian Empire, God is going to come and set up a kingdom. And he went on to explain which kingdom would have been present when um, Christ's kingdom was established. God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So in other words, we ain't waiting for a, a millennium down the road that ain't come yet. What the premillennialists argue is that what Daniel was seeing is the revive, the reviving of the empire that will be present when Christ uh, returns. Because what they're saying is that, yes, the Roman Empire was present when Christ came at first, but we're going to have a revival of that empire in the future. And this is what Daniel was, 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 was seeing when he says, in the days of these kings, will the God of heaven set up his empire? No, he wasn't. He, was, he, he, he showed the kingdom that will come in the order and the succession. History proved that. And again, it shows the authenticity of the Bible. And Daniel wrote these things long before they actually occurred. And who would have thought that the Babylonian empire would have fallen? This is one of the greatest empires of its time in the ancient world. Surrounded by massive walls that people thought were impenetrable. impenetrable. The, the, the Babylonian empire was like the Titanic. People thought it was invincible. But it came down. And God prophesied that it would come down. He said he would use Nebuchadnezzar. And we have that prophecy in Jeremiah to, to bring judgment on the children of Israel for their disobedience and that they'll be down in, in Babylon for 70 years. But then God also said through Jeremiah and through Isaiah that he will bring an end to that Babylonian kingdom. He will use them to judge the children of Israel, but then God will also bring judgment on that pagan nation. And he did. And, and Babylon fell as mighty as it was with walls so thick that they said chariots could, could run on those walls and so high that people thought that you could never, ever um, besiege Babylon. Uh, even Isaiah, in his prophecy, Isaiah chapter 44, explained when that would happen and how it would happen. That Cyrus would be able to penetrate um, the, the, the Babylonian kingdom because he, he would divert the river because the, the, the Babylonian walls had gates that went right down into the river, so you could can, you can not come under it. But what Cyrus did, he drained the river and was able then to get under the gates and enter into Babylon, so you didn't have to break the walls. And, and even that was prophesied. And so Babylon fell. And Greece, I'm sorry, the Middle Persian Empire that overtook Babylon fell, and the Grecian Empire fell. And the Roman Empire, and that was another strong, powerful empire that became global. And it exercised great power and authority, but Daniel has prophesied that the kingdom of God will come at that time, and it shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's why we say the kingdom of God is a present reality, but it will stand into the future when it gets its final consummation. Now, so we have an understanding then of, of the reign in terms of the empire that will be present um, when Christ's kingdom is established. Now, Daniel went a little further, and in Daniel chapter 9, we see now how... Sorry to interrupt you, Reverend Chapman. Yes, yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but verse 45, when, could you explain for verse 45 and it says, for as much as thou saw the stone cut out of the mountain. Yes. The stone cut out of the, because you, you, you explain about the kingdoms 
But the right. little stone now that came out of the mountain, who is that stone referring to? The stone that, and Daniel 235 said, the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That, that was a symbolic, um, prophetic statement of Christ. He is the stone that smote the image and became a great mountain. So, so that represented the kingdom of God starting small and spreading out and filling the whole world. The whole of the Roman Empire. Remember when we were, when we were looking at that? The gospel reached the whole of the Roman Empire and the gospel is still reaching people right down today. So that stone is the representation of, this, of the small beginning of the kingdom of God represented this, the beginning of, of Christ and it smote the mountain and sorry, it smote the image and became a great stone and filled the whole earth. So, so that stone represents Christ and the beginning of the kingdom. And it's and it start that came at the time of the Roman Empire because really and truly, um, Jesus didn't destroy the Roman Empire physically by fighting and establishing the kingdom, but he destroyed the Roman Empire in terms of its power and authority over the lives of people by being able to possess people's lives and and be able to reign in their hearts. And that basically was the was the was the collapse of the Roman Empire, the power of Christianity. Even though the Romans tried to destroy the church, they never succeeded. Nero said that he he would not leave the earth until every Christian was off the face of the earth. He went and, and, and left Christians, and, and Christians are still in the world today. And Nero, and Nero has died and rotten away, and and is nothing. And the and the church just stands today. So so that is is part of of the prophetic. Um, representation of what Daniel saw. Now, Daniel chapter 9 gives a specific indication. And it's the only prophecy in the, in the Bible that gives that specific indication. So I'm going to read it to you, and then we, we don't have time to go into details, but we'll leave that um, for the next session because this is a very, very, very important passage and as i said this passage gives some authenticity and power to the scriptures which any christian wants to understand it can use it to argue against anybody who does not believe in the power and the authenticity of the bible in the first year of the rest the son of ahasuerus the seed of medes which made king over the realm of Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So Daniel is reading Jeremiah, and he has been made aware, we look at these things um, next week, of, of a prophecy that was made by Jeremiah indicating that the Jews will be taken captive by the Babylonians, by Nebuchadnezzar, and they'll be held in captivity for 70 years. The 70 years is drawing close since the time of the prophecy. It's about um, 68 years down the road. So there are about two more years. Some people say three, but so it's roughly two to three years left. So Daniel is looking now for the completion of, of that prophecy and that the Jews will now get a chance to go back to Jerusalem. And Daniel's understanding was that that is when the kingdom of God will be established. When the Jews come out of captivity, go back to their homeland of Judah, and God reinstates them and restores them. That was his understanding. So now he is praying, and the most of that chapter... Um, is a prayer, so we will not go through all of that prayer. I just established the, the timing of that and the context. So Daniel is now praying to God and he's interceding. He is like being a mediator now, mediator, because he knows that before God's kingdom is established and he understands that the Jews must come to a place of repentance and restoration for, for God to establish his kingdom among them. 
So he sees the time is drawn. His understanding is that it will take place after that 70 years is over. Of course, he was wrong. So that's why Gabriel, the angel, came to him to correct him. I said, Daniel, the time is not then as you think. This is what is going to happen. And you pick up from verse 24. Daniel chapter 9. It says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to see up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the Holy One, the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command meant to restore and to build Jerusalem until unto sorry, the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of war desolations are determined. Remember, we talked about that when we were looking at the destruction of, 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 of Jerusalem. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that are the and and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's a little bit difficult part to understand at the end. Now, in a nutshell, what Gabriel came to Daniel and said to him: God's kingdom is not going to be established seventy years after. Um, they were taken captivity in captivity in Babylon. It's not happening yet, Daniel. 490 years. Those are weeks of years. I'll, I'll explain that um, in, in the next session. But guess give you in a nutshell. 490 weeks of years have been prophesied before the Messiah comes. So you have 490 more years to go before the Messiah actually comes and sets up the kingdom. And a decree is going to be given to go back to restore and rebuild the city of, of Jerusalem. When that decree is given, count 483 years from the time that decree is given. We're going to look at when that decree was given. The Messiah is going to come. But he's going to be cut off, meaning that the Messiah is going to be killed. He is going to be crucified. He didn't use those exact words. But that's what the prophecy is, is indicating. And he's not going to be cut off for himself. In other words, it's not because of anything he has done. He's going to be, be, be killed for, for somebody other than himself, for other people. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah said. The chastisement of our peace was upon, upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's what Daniel was seeing as Gabriel revealed to him that Christ would come and he would be cut off, but not for himself. So, so there we have the timing. Now, different interpretations are going to come as to when the clock started. Which of the decree that was given? Because there are four different decrees that were given. And now we have to establish from which one is Daniel going to be counting for those 483 years that will indicate when the Messiah was, was going to come. But don't, guess, let, don't get us, let's get confused and tied up now with the dates and timing. What that prophet is saying is that there was a specific time indicated as to when the Messiah would come and the fact that he was going to, to be killed and, and that also is in the reference. And it also prophesied that after the Messiah dies, another prince is going to come and that the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed by the desolation. That is what Jesus was referring to. Remember we, we did Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus said. According to the abomination of desolation. Spoken by Daniel. Which means that Jesus will come. And die. 
before the temple was destroyed. It, it, it happened. Jesus came and he died before the temple was destroyed. Daniel saw that in a revelation and it could only have been given to him by God because he was making this prophecy some 500 years before it actually happened. Now we're going to break that down and see how it relates to Christ what the time period could represent and what the full 490 years were out to be because the, pre the premillennialists are saying that we only can account for the 483 years and the other seven years is what is going to come in the future as the tribulation period. They say the, 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 the clock stopped at the 483 years when the Messiah came and that that's where the church came in, but God held back his plan for, for the Jews. Because remember, the angel told Gabriel that the prophecy is concerning the Jews and the city. And so they say that, that a lot of the promises that were made to the Jewish people have not yet been fulfilled, and God has cut out that seven years that will wait to be fulfilled in the future. That the tribulation period will come, and then after the tribulation period come, God will set up his kingdom, reign for a thousand years, and fulfill all the promises that were left to be fulfilled that were cut short in Daniel's prophecy. Is that so? We will see when we come back next week. And we look in greater depth to understand in Daniel chapter 9 and look at some of the territory references. And then we also um, go over to Revelation chapter 20 and see if the thousand year period fits in the God's concept. And we look at some of the, the prophecies from the Old Testament that they used to support the millennial reign. And we will have to conclude, we will have to decide, we will look at those scriptures, whether or not they refer to the millennial kingdom or the Messiah. I want you to check three of them that I will leave with you now. Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah chapter 11, and Isaiah chapter 65. Read those and look at the prophecies and we will come and see if they are talking as well about the kingdom of God that was to come when Christ came or if it's referring to a thousand years in the future when Christ will set up a physical kingdom. We're going to stop at that point. If there are any questions, of course, I will, will answer before That's we close. Point. Yes. So we have an a exciting week coming next week, so don't miss it. Those are, are two key Bible references that you, you want to understand. Daniel chapter 9 in its completeness and Revelation chapter 20. Along with those other passages that I've given you from Isaiah and some others that we will look at as well, speaking about the kingdom. So you might even go into three sessions to really complete this understanding of the scriptures in relation to the kingdom because there are many. And they are very, very significant in our understanding of the kingdom and its timing. So I thank you and I appreciate your discussion tonight again and the questions and the dialogue. That was very good. And we hope to continue on this vein next week. So God bless you and you have a good night. I turn over to Reverend Aline.